Okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Gounejaï. I am one of the fellows in the Center for Global Studies and I'm the uh, lead for Borders and Globalization. And so, um, and, and I'm the, uh, 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 I guess, co-director of the European Studies Program at UVic. And we've organized this year, we have a lecture series on um, EU issues um, that is uh, being offered by a group of colleagues um, and students from UVic. And today we have the great pleasure to have uh, 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 Benjamin Perrier, who is originally from the University of Geneva, but who's been with us for a number of years now as a postdoctoral fellow. He is a, he's a legal scholar. He's a uh, uh, studies more specifically um, all of the international agreements on the kind of laws and regulation, international regulation that organize cross-border relations and cross-border regions. And today, um, and he's, he's doing a number of work, different works for us. He's been working on a book looking at what he calls the postmodern border, which is really just a book looking at um, um, all of the, all of the um, legal uh, texts that organize cross-border um, circulation in the world, which is it's quite an ambitious project. As part of this book, he's worked on a couple of chapters that focus on the European Union, which is a very interesting case study because as some of you know, it has the architecture of uh, something that is in between an international organization and a confederation of states. And so it's, it's a very interesting case study when you look at it from the perspective of borders because of the division of powers between the different levels of governments, but also the kind of policies that straddle the internal borders of the EU versus the kind of policies that straddle the international border of the EU and the different 27 member states now. And today we're very happy and very um, um, and honored to have uh, Benjamin talk to us about the complex relations between borders and the European Union, or the question of the European governance of borders. And so we will have a presentation for about half an hour to 45 minutes, and then we have time for questions. We are only recording the presentation. So if you have questions and you think they should be outside of the recording, please save them for the end of the presentation. And thanks to all for being with us. Benjamin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emmanuel, for this uh, great presentation. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here for, with you today to present this uh, complexity of the multiple relations between the borders and the EU. And I call that the question of European governance of borders. <clears throat> so let's uh, speak to the structure of the, of the speech today. Uh, after a brief introduction, uh, where I will explain the, the theoretical and the legal aspects of the method I chose, and also uh, a big overview of uh, mul the multiple pieces uh, which can explain the complexity of the relations between uh, EU and the borders. So I divided my, uh, my speech in three big parts. The first part will be about the European governance of national legal borders. What it means national legal borders is the relations between the legal system of states and the legal system of European Union. The legal borders between the state and the European Union are a kind of legal borders, and we will, uh, we will see uh, the interconnection between them. It's a manner, uh, it's a possibility of, uh, of legal complex borders. It means, in a nutshell, the state of uh, anyone, uh, any state in the European Union is an integrated state inside 
the legal system and the legal system needs the states to be a European Union. So it's a, it's a melting uh, legal uh, intersystem between uh, the European Union and the states. So that's the main, uh, that's very important to start by this point because it uh, it's explains a lot of uh, complexities. So the second part and the third part are more classical. The second part will be about the European governance of internal legal borders. So uh, between states member of the European Union, we will speak about the internal market, the Schengen uh, area, but for the internal part, uh, we will speak also about uh, the European governance through territorial cooperation. Um, so as as we could as you could see, it's not it's not a security. Uh, I'm not a security minded, so I I uh, I explore all the bordering processes in a multiple as aspect, and not only about security, not only about immigration, I could speak also about commercial relations and this uh, interrelationship between the, the, the legal structure of the European Union and the states. So the third part will be about um, European governance of, ex of external legal borders. And at this, in this part, we will speak more about the uh, commercial relation between European Union and uh, other states, and we will speak also a little bit about the immigration control and uh, different agencies uh, as Frontex and, and a short, a very short uh, word about the asylum. And we will conclude this, uh, this, uh, this speech about uh, the European uh, governance of borders by asking uh, what is uh, the legal nature or political nature of the EU and uh, where are the borders of the EU, etc. So I'm happy to start for the detail of the introduction. So the European governance of borders, of course, is complex, uh, dynamic, multi-actor, multi-sector, multi-level. Uh, it's a huge su subject, it's a huge object, um, it's a big puzzle with multiple pieces and uh, multiple trends and, and dynamics. Nothing is very, uh, nothing is totally coherent, of course, huh? it's uh, very complex to go inside, and it's very complex to understand everything. Uh, so, um, and, and we could ask this question of European uh, governance of borders in multiple ways. You have a lot of questions possible, a uh, lot of angle of views. We, you, you, we could analyze the European Union by the institutional uh, system and the, 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 the different institutions, the Commission, the Council, etc. But we could uh, analyze the European Union by the material law. It's a lot of different uh, subject, uh, legal subject, uh, environmental, commercial, uh, security, etc. So our method here <coughs> is to, this, this, uh, this lecture is organized as a, a big overview of the multiple forms of the EU bordering processes. So not only security and control, but as I said, relation between states and the EU, territorial cooperation, Schengen area, European citizenship, commercial relations. So we need to remind, uh, we need to, uh, to have that in mind. One member state in the European Union, it's an integrated state. It means it's completely linked to the European Union system. And uh, one, uh, one principle of the organization of this complexity is the indirect administration. So it means the states are the key pieces to administrate the policies of the European Union. That's a principle since, since, uh, since the start. So uh, about the historical overview, so I will go quickly because uh, it's, it, everyone could know that. Uh, 1951, the European Coal and Steel Community with six founding members. 1957, the same six countries signed the Treaties of Rome and they built the European Economic Community. At this moment, the, the European Economic Community is, is already uh, has already the purpose to build a common market. 
with the freedom of, 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 uh, of movement of goods. And also at this moment, you have the principle of non-discrimination between workers uh, who, could, uh, who could work in these six, uh, six countries. So in 1986, a very important piece, the Single European Act, because at this moment, they create the internal market with the idea of uh, no internal frontiers inside this uh, internal market. By definition, this internal market, uh, it means uh, no borders and no obstacles to the freedom of circulation. So uh, the, 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 the Single European Act uh, organized the these four main free uh, freedom uh, of movements, of freedom of movements of goods, persons, services, and capital. So this 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 um, date, 1986, is very important to 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 understand the, the at at the same time the 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 way of the European Union is becoming more integrated at this at this moment. Uh, in 1992, of course, you have the European single market becomes a reality. Um, 90, 1993, the Treaty of Maastricht established the European Union as we know uh, the concept today. And ben 2002, Benjamin, yes. Ben Benjamin, sorry for interrupting. Well, we can't see your slides in the slide deck. All we're seeing is the first slide. You can see my, the slides? Uh, no, how I'll, could I? Okay, we'll check. This one you could see, and this one you, you can't see? No, now we can see. I think I can see. Now it's okay, introduction, yes? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. perfect, sorry. Uh, uh, me, I was, uh, I was in front of my, uh, my good, uh, good slide. Thank you for this, for, for this observation. So uh, this introduction is divided in three parts. The overview, as I said, uh, an overview of multiple forms of EU bordering processes. Uh, I just uh, finished to speak about the historical overview about these different dates uh, 90, from 1951 to, uh, to 2009 with the Treaty of Lisbon. And we know Jean Monnet, uh, parenthesis about Jean Monnet. Of course, Jean Monnet uh, was uh, a smart thinker, a smart political uh, people uh, guy. And he already think, he already thought about uh, the the cross-border integration system at, in 1943. Uh, he spoke about the integration between the two regions, French and Germany, with this very strong industrial uh, uh, region. Okay, so next slide. It's okay, you could see it? Okay. So, uh, I'm always in the introduction, so, uh, we need also to understand, we need also to, to in order to answer the, the complex relation between EU and borders, we need also to ask ourselves what is EU in the legal sense. Uh, and you have a lot of theoreticians, a lot of thinkers who have been, uh, who have been thinking about that, like, a, like a, Mireille Delmas Marty, who, who is thinking about this concept of ordered pluralism to put everything together. And in Canada, we call, we call that cooperative federalism. So it's, it's, it's the same idea. Right? It's, it's the idea of uh, multiple different pieces. Uh, they, should, they should interact and they should work with each other in a good manner to, to solve the, the, to solve the pub public uh, problems. And uh, maybe is it a federation of nation state? And you know this, uh, this, uh, this uh, famous expressions. But in, we are sure about that. The uh, EU is a re re reorganization of sovereignties, of course, because it's a redistribution of function of sovereign function of competencies of, of sovereign competencies. So uh, is, is the states, the state members inside the EU EU are not anymore uh, a classical and modern state. They are completely uh, different than, than before. So European Union is based on the, on the mantra or motto uh, called United in Diversity. And this United in Diversity is the main huge 
concept, if you want, who is uh, who is who is the synthesis of the the complexity of the, what is the EU, and it's it's and the challenge is to forge a balance between unity and diversity, the dynamics of integration and differentiation. So it's always always uh, states and European Union are, are linked by I call that the coexistentialism. They, they, they need each other to, to perpetuate themselves. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's an one explanation of this complexity and uh, everything is there uh, related. Um, of course, the relationship between the European Union and the border are complex and ambivalent, but this board, the borders I'm, call, um, I'm speaking as uh, Frédéric Bero says, uh, they are not linked with, they are not eliminating the, the borders as political object. The line, the territorial lines have, uh, have their existence inside another order, which is the international legal order. So um, every state inside the European Union they still have their territorial lines as the territorial borders and boundaries. Uh, which delimitate their territory where they have the control of the people. So this part is 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 not is not uh, ch changing is not changed by the European Union. All the other parts have changed, but this part uh, not. So uh, and uh, and to understand also a little bit about the the extension the the extension of this massive uh, European Union. Uh, legal construction, uh, we have an article about uh, the, in the Treaty of the European Union, the Article 3.5, in its relations with the rest of the world, the Union affirms and promotes its values and interests. So it means European Union is not only place based in the European continent, uh, is also world based. And it, in every contract, every negotiations, uh, this the European Union has uh, the, the European Union uh, put inside uh, values of democracy, example. So it's very important to understand also this piece. Finally, uh, uh, European Union and the complex relation with the borders is there. This there the borders of the state, but also the borders of this complex European system. Uh, we need to have a multiple uh, function, functional scope uh, and, and space in mind, uh, legal space. Every, you, have a, you have a multiple, yeah, multiple spaces and multiple scopes. Uh, and I think that's the, the main characteristic of the European system. So the question is simple. This complex situation I just briefly described makes or not the EU main actor in the governance of European borders. Could you see the slide? Okay, perfect. So my first part is about the European governance of national juridical or legal borders. Uh, this first part is, is very focused on the integral relationship between the legal system of the states and the legal system of the European Union. You need to understand this part because it means they are all together. They are not separated, they are integrated. Of course, they are integrated with multiple manners. It depends each state, it depends the details of uh, acceptation and the detail of jurisprudences. But but these two examples I will I will speak about are very illustrative to to speak uh, about this uh, this uh, melting system between European Union and the states. So we have two legal uh, decision. Uh, one called the Van Gaan and Loos uh, against the Netherlands administrator der Bestlastigen. I don't know how to to say that in Netherlands, but so this. This decision uh, build the principle of direct effect is one of the very most important decision and one of the most important uh, principle. It means, as I said, the community constitutes a new legal order of international law. So we could notice that this in this decision, 
the switch between the international between the idea of European Union as a simple international organization and more uh, uh, more in fact this decision build the independence of uh, European Union as a, a new object in law you know that's what uh, I interpret the community constitutes a new legal order of international law. And in, in this decision, uh, the principle of direct effect as a, as a as a simple signification, it means the citizenship of the European Union are directly uh, linked to the to the European Union uh, system. Um, in, in a nutshell, this principle of direct effect allows citizens to directly invoke community law as soon as it is published in the official, official journal of the EU. So it, it means now the European Union system and the citizenship are in direct relation together. So uh, they are bypassing the, the, the level of the states. That's a very important decision. And the second decision, decision Flaminio Costa uh, against Enel, the jurisprudence, the Court of Justice of the European Union built what uh, we call the primacy of European Union law. So this principle is also a super important principle. Uh, it means simply that all EU laws has a higher value than the national laws of the member states. Every national act of uh, binding legal nature are subject of the community law. So it means even the constitutions of, of the states. So this, this uh, decision was uh, very, uh, of course, but was very uh, con uh, controversial because a lot of states didn't accept uh, this, uh, this uh, invocation of supremacy, supremacy by the European Union over their own constitution. So the process was super long. Uh, it depends every, it depends. The process was different, uh, uh, different uh, in each different states. The, the, the reaction of the, of the judicial system in each state was different. But in a nutshell, these two principles are the key principles to to, to understand the European Union uh, integrated in the states and, this, and to understand also at this, and the second and the integration of the state inside the, the European Union system. Let's go on this slide. That's the detail of what I was just said. Uh, principle of direct effect and pr principle of primacy of European Union law. But instead of, instead of having EU supremacy, there are interrelationship between legal structures. So it's not a vertical, pure vertical and hierarchical uh, system. It's more complex than that. Uh, and we, we will explain this, more, this complexity of the dialogue the dialogical dynamic between European Union and uh, the states with this example of the preliminary ruling in French, renvoi préjudiciaire. Uh, this example is, uh, is uh, one illustration of the dialogue between jurisdiction, between national jurisdictions and European uh, jurisdiction. So it's an illustration of the of the no border, no legal borders in the sense of a limit is a more uh, illustration of borders in interaction, in, in an interactive way. They are cooperating, they are dialoguing. And in this example, uh, the, the national jurisdictions ask, ask to the European Union court uh, to help them to solve a, a legal questions. So you have two types, you have the reference for interpretation of the norm and the reference in validity of a norm of a secondary law. So this example in a nutshell helps to understand this connection between these two legal system in the dialogical and dialogue and, and in cooperative, co cooperative way. Uh, one of the main legal scholar, European scholar who 
who was judge at the same time who was in uh, European law teacher and at the same time advisor, uh, Pierre Pescator, he called that EU law is a law of integration. And this law of integration is fusional and unitary. It explains uh, in, uh, in three words, this how do you say intertreatment between the, the two legal systems. But uh, if, if we have a lot of interrelationship between the European Union system and the state system, who, which are finally just one big uh, complex system, uh, as I said uh, five minutes ago, the states are not uh, happy with this supremacy of the European legal system. So they have uh, developed an idea of juridical limits of this uh, EU uh, integration system. We call that, I could call that, or we could call that a European juridical mutualism. No one is the, no one is the sovereign actor over the other one. They are cooperated at, at every level. Um, yes, I call that also the dynamic co of coexistentialists because both of, of our entities, states and European Union are cooperate uh, with each other. Uh, so I, I think you know this, uh, this European Union system structure. Uh, European Union is not competent for everything. Uh, and I will speak about that in, in two minutes. And we could, uh, we could identify three main principles which are organizing these relations between European Union system and the states. The first principle is the principle of attribution of legal competencies. It means the European Union is only competent in the legal framework, uh, which is uh, controlling, which is organizing, which is organizing her. Uh, it means also any competence not attributed to the Union in the treaties belongs to the member states. The second principle of, the, of this structural organization is the principle of subsidiarities. This principle of subsidiarities applies just for shared competence. And the third principle is the principle of proportionality. Uh, when we think about the legislation, we need to justify this new legislation in the principle with this uh, with this uh, limit of proportionality. We 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 shouldn't go beyond what is necessary to achieve the objectives. So it means, in practical way, no detailed legislations. So, as I said, the states are not happy with the supremacy of uh, the. European Union integration. So they build a legal limit. We call that respect of constitutional identity. In the treaty, uh, Article 4.2 of the Treaty of the European Union, we could read that the Union shall respect the equality of member states before the treaties as well as their national identities inherent in their fundamental structures, political and constitutional. So this idea of constitutional identity is like a legal limit of the integration process. Uh, it means in a nutshell, the European Union can't be uh, stronger or higher or supreme or sovereign over the constitution of the states. That's a legal limit written in this treaty on European Union. So the balance is now is like a fair balance between the European Union and the states. And now they, 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 could, they could understand better their, their limits from each other and inside each other. But of course, what is constitutional identity? It's a, of course, it's an interpreted, interpretative concept. In France, if I speak up for the France, uh, France example, maybe it's the language of the Republic, maybe it's the Secularism. So identity, as we know, is not a, is not a picture. It's not a permanence. It's a it's a construction. So I think in the future we will have a new, new, uh, new, uh, 
your processes ab about this, this understanding of what, what is constitutional identity. So let's, speak, let's have this picture, simple picture to understand the structure of the competencies between European Union and the states. That's, that's, a, that's a key uh, picture to understand where the states have the competencies and where the European Union has her own competencies. So we could see three categories, the exclusive competence of the European Union, the shared competence between the states and the European Union, and the supporting competencies. Of course, the most important thing for the EU is the exclusive competence, as, as we could see the, Europe, the exclusive competence is uh, for the European Union as exclusive competence in the customs union, as also for the, for the EU, the Euro. Also for international agreement and the commercial policy. So we could notice a lot of competencies uh, in relation with the outside of the European Union. So it's very important to understand the legal structure. That's the legal structure of the European Union and the distribution of competencies between both actors. But of course, we have also the shared competence. So it means member states cannot exercise competence in areas where the union has done so. And a lot of a, a, a big list of, of shared competence. The internal market is a shared competence. The economic, social, and territorial cohesion is a shared competence between the EU and the states, the environment, the consumer protection, etc. And of course, the area of freedom, security, and justice also is a shared competence. And the third category is the supporting competence. The union can carry out action to support, coordinate, or supplement member states' actions. And you have the list of these different competencies. Where are the limits of the, of the European Union legal system? We have noticed the different distribution of competencies. We have noticed this complexity of the integration and the melting with each other. We have, uh, we have uh, viewed the limit of this integration with this concept of constitutional identity. We have uh, noticed also the, but where, until where, the scope of the European Union is, is going in the world. So, sorry, this map is in French, but you need to understand the, the deep blue is, of course, the European Union member states territorially implemented in the continent of Europe. But because some, some countries of this European Union have uh, islands around the world, as the example is France, as example, La Réunion in the Pacific Ocean, you have La Réunion, it's a small island in the Pacific Ocean. You have also the small territory of France is in Guyane bordering Brazil, and you have also the, the Guadeloupe and, the, and the Martinique. So these four, these four uh, locations are part of the European Union legal system scope. So European Union is not only continental, is linked to the organization, the constitutional organization of the states. So the European Union scope is also, it works also for this island or piece of lands far uh, from the European Union continent. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I put this picture here to make, to, to make you feel comfortable with this idea European Union is not only in the European continent, it's everywhere in all the places, territorial places uh, linked to the member states with the, with the good example of France. So my second part is about the European governance of internal borders, internal legal borders. In this second part, we will speak about a uh, little bit about the internal market and about Schengen for the, for the internal part. The internal market of the European Union 
is uh, established by treaty, of course, and the Treaty of the European Union, Article 3.3 is explicit. It's written, the Union shall establish an internal market. Uh, another article linked to this one, but in the other treaty, Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, because you know you have two main treaties, the Treaty of the European Union and the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which are, inter of course, integrated in each, uh, in each other. So this treaty, Article 26.2, says the internal market shall comprise an area without internal frontiers in which the free movement of goods, persons, services, and capital is ensured in accordance with the provisions of this treaty. So the internal market is a huge, maybe the most important construction uh, or success of, of the European Union with these four freedoms of movements and this concept of internal market. So we, just with this example, we could also understand that what I said in the first part, the states are not anymore uh, is so isolated in their territory. Of course, they are legally inter, in uh, interrelations with the European Union system. They are part, their territory are part of this internal market. It's, it's the same, it's finally is the same thing. Uh, an internal market in the European Union is covering all the territories of, of the states. I would like to focus in one specific point is the mutual recognition of some products in, uh, in the internal market. It's very interesting to have this, this idea of mutual rec recognition. What it means, you remember the principle is the free movement of goods inside the internal market of the European Union. But outside uh, what we call the harmonized products, we have a free movement of goods guaranteed by mutual recognition. What it means, the principle of mutual recognition means one product, imagine, example, one Italian product or one German product have by, by, the, legal, uh, by the legal rules, have the capacity to be, to be, to cross the border, of course, but to be sell in other territories without any other uh, administrative uh, papers. So this principle of mutual recogn recognition means any product lawfully placed on the market in one EU country is freely marketed in the other member states. That's a huge uh, idea because it means the same product has the capacity to be everywhere in the territories just by this recognition of the, of, uh, the just by this mutual recognition, this legal mutual recognition of any products. Of course, this, this process of mutual recognition was, a, was a, a stepping process. And we have a very important uh, decision called Cassis de Dijon in February 20, 1971. And this, uh, this decision about Cassis de Gilles says, there is no valid reason to prevent alcoholic beverages provided they are lawfully produced and marketed in one of the member states from being introduced into other uh, member states. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a concept of mutual recognition, finally very um, intuitive. One product, one national product is a European product by definition, and it means he has the freedom of circulation everywhere if, if, with the same, uh, with the same uh, qualities inside the territory of the European Union. And uh, you, we have a recent regulation about that uh, for the people who are interested for the specific topic of the food, of the mutual recognition between national products inside the European Union system. So let's speak now. We speak about the we spoke about the internal market. Let's talk, let's speak a little bit about the Schengen area. Is the most famous, maybe a well-known space associated with the European Union system. 
So of course, it's linked with the security, but at the same time, it's linked with the freedom of circulation. So Schengen has two dimensions, finally, a yeah, dimension for the internal borders and, and, and dimension for the external borders. Uh, uh, what is it? Schengen is, uh, is, uh, is in a nutshell, the legal principle is the free movement of persons uh, respected uh, inside the European Union. Um, but as I said, it's balanced because it's it's uh, it's the foundation of the free of the no control at the internal borders, and is also at the same time the foundation of the control at the external borders. So Schengen, that's why I put Schengen in the second part as internal borders, but I also put Schengen as in my third part, the government, the European governance of external borders, because it's is is both. And of course, you have a lot of regulation linked about the Schengen, uh, Schengen area. An example, the, the last one was the regulation 2016-399, establishing the Schengen borders code. And inside the Schengen borders code, you have everything you need to know about the cross borders, uh, inside the territory, about the level of control, the level of, uh, of surveillance when you cross the external borders. And uh, I put I put inside uh, inside the slide the two the two legal definition of what is internal borders and what is external border. So internal border means the common land borders, including river and lake borders of the member states. Internal borders means also the airports of the member states for internal flights and internal borders. It's uh, means also sea, river, and lake ports of the member states for regular internal ferry connection. And external borders, the, the definition is simple, is the borders which are not internal. So, <clears throat> so with this Schengen area, we understand one uh, example of what I said, introduction of the functional area an area, uh, link, a Schengen functional area, a functional space uh, with 26 EU members and four non-EU members. Uh, and this idea of free space or space without controls at, at the borders, uh, we have a historical antecedent in, in Europe. Example between uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland, they have created a free travel area before European Union. And of also the Treaty of Benelux between Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, they were also familiar with this, with this no control uh, 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 between them at, at their borders. And also the Nordic Passport Union, which is an, uh, another example. So, about this uh, functional space about Schengen, uh, you remember two dimension, one internal aspect and one in external aspect. The internal borders are opened and the external borders are controlled. So it's a functional space and in a nutshell, it's a passport free travel area between, between these members of the Schengen area. It means the checks are abolished within it uh, within it, uh, within state inside the territory of European Union, and it means also common rules about visa and controls at external borders. So the the the, the, the this one element and the second element means the states needs to cooperate more and more, and the service the police services between countries needs to be more aware about what's going on in the other countries. And all this, all this uh, complexity of no borders control have, a, have an effect is, uh, is this cooperation at the technological level. I will, I, will, I will speak a little bit about that in the next slide. So in this slide, of course, you could see the Schengen space. So all the purple states are member of this functional space called Schengen area. Every uh, controls, every borders uh, shouldn't have any controls for the purpose of the crossing of the borders. 
and you have also the uh, other countries, Romania and Bulgaria, who are members of European Union, but not yet members of the functional space of uh, and Croatia. Also. And you have also United Kingdom, uh, Ireland is the same than Romania and Bulgaria. They are not part of the Europe, the Schengen area. And you have also uh, European, uh, the United Kingdom, which is uh, now neither member of European Union, neither member of uh, Schengen. I think it's a good map, but uh, sorry for that, it's also in French. But we could understand this, this huge functional space which are which is completely uh, 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 replacing the territorial space we know in the modern uh, in the modern sense any, I, any yes yes you should try to finish in the next 10 minutes if you want us to have time for questions okay perfect i have four slides thank you um You're welcome so, as I said, I'm not security minded, but it's important to understand the security uh, species of the European Union construction. So we have also a territorial cooperation. Territorial cooperation is linked with this past spatial planning. That's an, another, another branch of, of the governance of, uh, of the European governance of borders, because at the territorial point is at the spatial planning uh, a level, uh, European Union is also deconstructing the, the territorial limits to create cross-border spaces at the local level, but also at the transnational level, and also between regions inside uh, European Union. So European Union has, has developed this tool of called European Territorial Cooperation, and with a specific legal tool, huh, it's uh, quite new because it's just 15 years old. This uh, this uh, European grouping, this European grouping of territorial cooperation. That's a legal tool, practical tool, which is helping to transcend borders between neighbors and inside the territory of European Union, but also with the neighbors outside the territory of the European Union. And, and uh, that's a very important tool because it was very complicated to cooperate with another uh, collectivity and other public uh, entities from the, uh, uh, of, the, of another country. And this tool is uh, as the purpose to help the connection between collect between uh, between entities. Uh, not only local entities, because the states could be part of this uh, European grouping of territorial cooperation. So uh, finally, it's, this legal tool is, is uh, as the purpose to solve the, the administrative conflict, the difference between legislations, and it's a very important tool. Uh, recently, European Union has also developed a mechanism to, to permit the application of a national law in the other country uh, which is neighboring. So it means if we speak about the United States and Canada, it means the Canadian national law could apply in, uh, in, U, in the US territory. So you could, you could imagine the, 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 huge, uh, the huge step, uh, uh, the huge postmodern step if the national law of one country is applying in another country, it means a lot of, uh, it means the sovereignty is, uh, is performed, of course. Mm -hmm. And the European Union, in this spatial planning dimension, they have developed also what we call the macro regional strategies, is also a functional area. And they developed that in the Baltic Sea, in the Danube region, in the Adriatic and Ionian region, and also for the Alps, the Alpine regions. So this three dimension territorial cooperation with this cross border cooperation, with the transnational cooperation, with the international cooperation, plus this EGTC, the European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation, plus this new mechanism of, of the national law in possi with possible implementation in the other uh, territory, plus the macro regional strategy, all these parts are also deconstructing the territorial limits. And, and it's a key piece of the spatial planning of the European Union, and it's a key piece of the governance of uh, the European Union 
of borders. So let's finish about the third, the third part about the Schengen, uh, but in this time, external borders of, of the territories. Uh, in a nutshell, I will, I will be short because uh, we spoke a little bit in the, in the second part about Schengen. Uh, we have an internal dimension. It means no control inside the territory with exception, of course, with exception with terrorist attack, uh, an exception with, uh, with uh, threat, threat against the national security. In a nutshell, this borders construct these external border controls of European Union inside the Schengen legislation, inside this functional space of Schengen, have been delocalized. Now they are not inside, of course, they are out, of, they are the limit of the territory of the European Union. They are also outsourced and digitized. Uh, the new reflection of the policymakers in European Union, they, they, they think about this concept of smart borders in Canada, between Canada and USA, we have, they have developed also these smart borders. You could, uh, is the concept of border filter. You could, uh, you could, uh, you, if you have a people, you could have difficulty to cross the borders, but if you have a good and this good have been standardized, you could, uh, that this good could cross the border without control. And uh, they have also developed this entry exist system, the traveler registration program. Uh, and it's very technical and they have also technological and digital system uh, in, in the European Union has developed this technological and digital system. And also the European Union has developed agency specifically uh, mandated to control the external borders, the Frontex, we, we know Frontex, and with this Frontex agency, the role of this Frontex agency is to coordinate operation between the member states for the management of external borders. Uh, and recently in 2019, they have also, uh, they have also developed what they said, border and coast guard corps of the European Union. So this, uh, these external borders, as we could notice, the European governance of external borders is very uh, technological, is very well elaborated, is a lot of uh, details. It uh, is a very, uh, it's a piece of the puzzle, very important. And to finish about the immigration, the, the, they have developed also uh, what, what I call outsources. So uh, it's quite, uh, the, the, the visa policy now, the control of the visa is, uh, is outside the territory of the European Union. They, they develop some embassy, example, in different countries in, in Africa, they develop some embassy where the people who want to go to visit European Union should receive their authorization to travel. So the control is externalized outside the European Union. And of course, this technological digital system, the Schengen information system and the visa information system, it's a lot of data uh, of, our, of our digital uh, fingerprints, of pictures of our faces, etc. So uh, every people who have been traveling in European Union, you are, your identity, your data are inside this uh, technological system of information. Two phrases for concluding this third part about the common custom tariff, that's the custom borders of the European Union, so that's also part of these external borders, and uh, two characteristics of the International Commercial Convention uh, of the European Union. So we, call, we could call that commercial legal frontiers of the European Union. So uh, as, we sh as we maybe know, as you maybe know, common custom tariff is not, is not one number, is a, piece, is a huge piece of, of legislations um, with a nomenclature, a combination of nomenclature or classification of goods uh, with, a, with, a, with a tariff which is different from the goods and where it's from, you know. So that's a, that's the common customs tariff. That's a huge piece of paper 
border paper connecting to the co common custom tariff and the commercial importations of goods uh, from the world. And two pieces, two information about this EU and the world trend dimension. Of course, as we noticed, uh, we are living in the era of crisis of multilateralism. Uh, each, each country now needs to have a bilateral agreement. They, they, they feel it's better for them to manage their, 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 their progression and their evolution. So the idea of the international commercial trade is to build common rules between countries. And the two characteristics is, uh, is uh, in this international commercial agreement between European Union and, uh, and uh, like example, Mexico, Japan, or Vietnam. The last one is the Vietnam agreement in 2020. Um, uh, inside this international inside this international commercial treaty you don't have only the uh, goods uh, the goods uh, the goods uh, legislation you have also uh, intellectual property dimension you have also regulatory cooperation you have also uh, public procurement so this this relation between european union and the other state through the commercial negotiation are not only com commercial good, they are establishing deep relation, deep legal relation between countries. And of course, as I said in the, in, before, the European Union tries to, to help or, or to not help, but to diffuse it, uh, our values uh, inside uh, other countries around the world through these agreements. So in conclusion, the main idea, territorial limits still present uh, and important, but many functional spaces of specific governance. Uh, and finally, the EU manages the functional value of territorial boundaries. We call that defunctionalization of internal borders. But also the EU manages the functional spaces and the borders of these functional spaces, example, Schengen, and also the functional relation linked to the territory of the state and the space, uh, the functional space. So my last question is uh, borders of EU, yes or not? As, we, as, as you have, uh, as you could see in this presentation, in this brief presentation, maybe European Union is uh, the main actor in the governance of European borders and this governance takes multiple ways and multiple function and dispositives. Uh, thank you for your listening. I'm very happy to have been uh, able to share this, this puzzle. I, I know it's very complex and I know it's difficult to digest, but with this organization, this third part about the European governance at the legal level, the European governance of the internal borders and the European governance of the external borders, we could have a big picture of what's going on uh, in European Union. So I thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you. Super, thank you, Ben. Uh, so um, I will take questions. I'm asking uh, you all to maybe just let me know in the chat that you want to ask a question. And then I'll just uh, basically uh, give the floor to whomever wants to raise a question in turn. Um, and to give you some time to get started, uh, what I'm going to do is um, ask you, uh, Benjamin, a couple of questions. And um, uh, with regard to your slide number 10, I was wondering... Uh, I'm, I'm just going to stop the recording, sorry.